Thank you. For, my name is Steph Lindquist. I'm the executive director of the Center for Constitutional Design here at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. Um, we are very excited to host an event today about the irrelevant First Amendment. You may not have realized it was irrelevant, but we're going to learn why it is today from our <laughs> distinguished speaker. And um, this is a wonderful follow on to an event we had with Robert Post, the Dean Emeritus at Yale Law School uh, a couple of weeks ago. So I am very pleased uh, to welcome to the law school um, our guest speaker, Ash Bhagwat, who is a professor of law at UC Davis, where he has taught since 2011. Um, his most recent book, which I is obviously on point um, for this uh, conversation we're going to have today, was published by Oxford, sorry, Cambridge University Press in 2020, is called Our Democratic First Amendment. Um, an earlier book, um, The Myth of Rights, was published by Oxford University Press in 2010. So two distinguished books um, by uh, Professor Bhagwat, which I'm sure we'll hear something about or at least touch on uh, their contents today. Um, Professor Bhagwat has such a long, incredibly impressive resume. I'm not gonna read it. It is available to you, all the information about it here. But I do wanna say that um, not only did he clerk for Justice Kennedy, but he also clerked for one of the most influential federal judges, I think, in the history of the federal judiciary, and that is Richard Posner, who worked with a lot of my colleague political scientists uh, to write fascinating books about judicial behavior, among many other things. And he very much influenced my research as a political scientist. So um, what a wonderful, what wonderful two judges to clerk for, Kennedy and, um, and Posner. We also have joining us today, our very own Professor Jim Weinstein, the Don Crocchiola Chair in Constitutional Law here. All of you probably know him. Um, he also has a lengthy resume. I don't want to catalog here, but as I said in an earlier, uh, or a, uh, a, an event we had a couple of weeks ago as well, Professor Weinstein is one of the foremost experts on the First Amendment really in the world and um, is going to be, uh, visiting this fall, I think, at Oxford University, at University College at Oxford University, collaborating with some uh, distinguished scholars there, and then going on to the University of Melbourne to visit there as well. So he really does have, uh, carries with him a global, a, a global presence, and we're very, very pleased to have him be the moderator today for this event. A couple of housekeeping points. Um, one, I want to ask if you would sign in at the back before you leave, if you haven't already. And if you're not an ASU affiliated person, an employee or a student, we actually, if we're gonna take pictures, we actually have to have your waiver of our right to take your picture, um, or you have to accept our right to take your picture. Um, so we need you to sign a waiver up there if you don't mind doing that, if you're not uh, affiliated with ASU. And I wanna thank the American Constitution Society and Allison Sluga for partnering with us on this event. We hope this is the first of many such partnerships um, going forward. Um, the American Constitution Society is having their major student convention here in Phoenix at the end of March, very exciting time for them. And we uh, are again, very pleased to have the opportunity to partner with them. Thanks to Allison. I'm not sure if she's still getting a table. She's there she is. Thank you again, Allison, for, for your um, partnership on this event. So I'm going to turn the podium over. I think, Professor Bogwat, are you coming up first? I think you are. And then Jim is actually going to uh, comment on uh, the speaker's uh, presentation. So thank you so much to everybody. Thanks for being here. Did I miss anything, Carol? Okay, good. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you to the Center for Constitutional Design, um, to Steph Linquist, to Carol McNamara, and to my very old friend, Jim Weinstein. We have been friends long enough. <laughs> we have been friends long enough that you think I'm young. Um, I want to talk today about where we are with free speech and why it is that, despite the fact that I've spent my life writing about the First Amendment, I don't really do that much. Um, and what to do about this, because this is the Center for Constitutional Design. Um, I want to start off by acknowledging this is a paper that is in its infancy, like it's still in diapers. 
Um, so I, any and all feedback would be really useful because I'm still thinking about, well, honestly, what the answers are to the problems that I'm posing. Um, so here's the thesis. First Amendment law in the United States really was born in the fall of 1919 with Judge Justice um, Holmes's dissent in Abrams, the marketplace of ideas. Next 10 years, he and Justice Brandeis are writing dissents basically preserving the rights of dissenters. Um, so first, it was people opposing American entry into World War I. Then it was communists in the, during the first Red Scare saying, we should not be prosecuting these people. And that was the theme of, these were dissents, but by the 1930s, their protégés were getting onto the court. The Stromberg case said, you can't penalize someone for waving, waving a red flag. Yes, California once made it illegal to put, wave a red flag. Um, you know, it's progressing, 30s, 40s, dissenters are finally getting their say. 1950s, we have a relapse during the McCarthy era. Once again, we're not protecting dissenters. The Dennis case, we prosecute the, the leaders of the Communist Party. Um, fun fact, when I was in college, I ended up being on the same debate stage as Mr. Dennis, who by then was a very old man. But he's not, he's so I wave a lot when I'm talking, sorry. <laughs> 1969, Brandenburg versus Ohio. United States finally protects dissent and dissenters are now safe. And then something strange happens. The First Amendment, that's 54 years ago now, it's hardly a recent case. The First Amendment starts to walk strange paths. The point where today, for a long time, the First Amendment is obsessed with obscenity. Which, you know, whatever, but it's hardly, the Republic is not going to live or fall based on the, how we protect obscenity. Today, the First Amendment largely shows up in commercial disputes. Supreme Court spends an inordinate amount of its time deciding how cities can regulate commercial science. Talk about things that will not affect the future of the Republic. Campaign finance is the only area where the First Amendment is active in areas still relevant to democracy. Why has and dissent has disappeared from the Supreme Court's docket and frankly from First Amendment case? Why is that? Because it seems strange. After all, in our constitutional tradition, protecting dissenters, you would think, would be what free speech and the free press is all about. Certainly it was historically. Well, there's a good there's a there's a happy story, which is that the government doesn't prosecute dissenters. They've learned their lesson, Brandenburg is the law, and that, therefore it's all good. And there is some truth to it. Criminal prosecutions of dissenters is very rare in this country today, almost non-existent with one exception. Where we see the First Amendment playing a role, but a completely ineffectual one, the only area where really I see the state still trying to stamp out dissent is in the area of protest and assembly. Um, we, there's currently a strong movement across a number of states to make it effectively impossible to organize protests because basically these states are saying if any violence breaks out, the organizers basically are responsible for all the death. It's going to be, and current case law does not deal with that problem though, because the Supreme Court has forgotten that there's not just a speech clause in the First Amendment, there's also an assembly clause. That, by the way, is one of the topics of my book, our Democratic First Amendment, but it's not my topic today. Um, in addition, the First Amendment has failed to show up in terrorism prosecutions since 9 -11. Um, and that's a long story. I could talk about it during Q&A. But aside from those two things, is it true that dissent is now safe? Well, the answer is not really. Instead, what's happened is the fights have moved to areas where the First Amendment is absent. One, private platforms. Since 2010, when social media really took off, Essentially, all public debate has moved to private internet platforms. And as all of you know, the First Amendment does not apply to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, etc. They're private actors. The state action doctrine says they are not subject to rights. As a result, they do moderate content, i.e., censor, on a daily basis at a massive scale. Um, there's been a fair bit of work describing these basically censorship factories that have been developed by Facebook in particular around the world. Their accusations that the censorship goes too far, doesn't go far enough, depends on which side of the political spectrum you are. There have been recently attempts to regulate 
um, content moderation by platforms, notably the states of Florida and Texas. I think that's a bad idea. Talk a little bit more about it later, but happy to also talk about that during q &A. However, so the big question now is not, is the government suppressing speech, but in the private platform area, should the government step in to protect speech, which is a very strange First Amendment issue, right? It's, it's almost as if it's flipping the government's role on its place. Second, and even arguably more important, there's been a doctrinal development in the Supreme Court in the last 20 years. Basically, it takes two forms, so it's really one development. One is an enormous expansion of something called the government speech, which says that when the government is speaking, the First Amendment is silent. Um, and so when the government is speaking, basically it can do whatever it wants. Combined with that is a case called Garcetti, 10 years ago and more than that now, 15 years ago, which held that when a government employee is speaking in his or her role as a government employee, no First Amendment rights. Basically, the government can tell their employees what to do when they're on the clock. They're not on the clock when they're acting as private citizens. They do have lesser but still First Amendment rights, but on the clock, nothing. Why does this matter? Well, let's think about where currently dissent is being suppressed. Start with Florida's, what is called the Don't Say Gay Law, which regulates what teachers can say in the classroom. First Amendment, it's direct government regulation of speech that it doesn't like, right? About sexual orientation, about trans issues. First Amendment, absolutely. Why? Because when public school teachers are in the classroom, they have no First Amendment rights, see Garcetti. So there have been challenges to these laws, but other than some of the peripheral issues, I don't think there's much hope for these challenges. Second, book ban. There's been a huge movement to take books out of originally school libraries, but now public libraries more generally. Um, there's state laws, I think it was Oklahoma, I don't know, it was one a state recently adopted a fairly res restrictive rule on what kinds of books can be in any public library. Call it book banning. It's not book banning, to be clear. You can still buy these books in the states. But this is the point. It's not about suppressing dissent through the criminal process. It's about controlling what's on government property. Again, I think there's no First Amendment constraint there. I think the constraints are political at most, which means not a lot given polarization today. Why? Because the government speech doctrine gives the government huge amounts of power on what speech it wants to encourage and what speech it doesn't want to encourage, and libraries are public property. Private libraries are different, right? But, but, and by the way, so it simply doesn't show up. Now we come to the final sort of chapter in this, which is just starting today. And not this week. Governor DeSantis of Florida has announced massive uh, proposed legislation that would impose massive changes on the curriculums that are available at state universities in the state of Florida including prohibiting teaching things like critical race theory. I'm going to get into that, what that means, but in all sorts of other things that you're not, you cannot um, teach, it prohibits DEI efforts. Here, the First Amendment maybe has a little bit to say. Um, frankly, Jim knows more about this than I do, but there's, there are really difficult questions that remain completely unresolved about how academic freedom at public universities interacts with the First Amendment, especially with the Garcetti case. But it, there's at least a reasonable chance, especially given this Supreme Court, that the First Amendment actually will be absent over all of those disputes as well. Um, we don't know fully, but at least with respect to some things like controlling the curriculum, I'm actually quite confident the First Amendment will be absent because I think what is taught at a public university, for better or for worse, is something that the state probably can control, just as with K through 12. Finally, we come to the point, private universities and private employers more generally, but private universities are not a focus on. Like platforms, they are free from First Amendment constraints. They're not state actors. But they claim to be committed to academic freedom. 
that has been the sort of a, most private universities in this country claim some dedication to academic freedom, except for very explicitly religious universities, most of them say their commitment is absolute. But it appears to be voluntary because there's no really legal constraint on them that requires them to, to conform with academic freedom. And in recent years, we've had, actually in recent weeks, we've had two fairly dramatic events at Hamline University where an art history teacher was, well, she was not tenured, but she was um, let go, not renewed, for teaching an art history class in which a medieval painting that showed the Prophet Muhammad's face was, um, was shown, she displayed it after warning students that she was gonna do so, and that led to her termination. Harvard University, the Kennedy School, retracted an invitation basically to join as a researcher to the, the former president of Human Rights Watch because of anti, elected anti-Israeli bias. Both, if the First Amendment was in play and Garcetti did not control that a state school would raise profound First Amendment concerns. Only thing that's gonna cause, like Harvard is already backed up, but, um, but and I'm not sure where the Hemline dispute is, but I think it's still in the courts. But again, the First Amendment has nothing to say about this. But what's striking is, this is where the action is, right? This is where majoritarian forces on both sides, by the way, are trying to suppress views they don't like. This is what the First Amendment was about for the first 50 years of jurisprudence. And yet it's gone, simply gone. Right. Um, so when I say the irrelevant First Amendment, it sounds like hyperbole. I don't think it is. I think it's a very real phenomenon. Um, and so one is left with, well, what do we do about this? And this is where my paper gets very threadbare because this is this has been the story of my life for the last five years and seven years. Is I point out all these problems and people say, what should we do? And I say, ah, um, <laughs> which is so. One solution, regulate social media. Stop them from suppressing voices they don't like. I don't think so. <laughs> I still, and again, this is a talk in and of itself, but I am still of the view that there is a reason why we are incredibly skeptical when the government interferes with any sort of media or speech because the government's motivations are always suspect in this area because speech and democracy are like this. And you know what? All government officials want to remain government officials. It doesn't <laughs> matter if you're an elected representative in the state legislature or you're, the, you're the, basically the leader of communist China. You want to stay in power. Um, you do it in different ways. Xi Jinping has more direct tools at his disposal, but you do it. And in fact, if you look at recent efforts to regulate, I mean, the Florida law is such a disaster. I don't think. Basically, it's a law that says you can censor anyone you like, want except for politicians. Right? It's a law which basically says elected officials have greater First Amendment rights than citizens, which is, by the way, exactly the opposite of what should be true. The Texas law is a little more even-handed on its face, but when the governors, Santos in Florida and Abbott in Texas, signed the laws, they made signing statements saying the purpose of this is to enhance conservative voices. That's a problem, right? The government can't be doing that. It can't be in speech markets. It can't be addressed playing with the playing field that way, especially because we could talk about why conservative voices, whether there's an anti-conservative bias among social media, <laughs> Twitter now, no, in the world of Elon, but um, even in other platforms, it's a complicated story. But regardless, I and by the way, I'm equally unhappy with left-wing attempts to force social media to suppress content that they don't like, what they consider to be disinformation, because I think that they, again, are going to very similarly. It's not a coincidence that what really got Nancy Pelosi unhappy about Facebook was when Facebook refused to pull down a obviously doctored video, which was clearly a form of just humor that supposedly showed her being drunk. That's when she got really angry, which again shows politicians don't like to be shown in a bad light. So do I trust either side on this? So that's a bad idea. How about expanding the state action doctrine 
or reducing it, I guess, is what we've been doing. So that some private actors were dominant, like Facebook, which is a very, very powerful platform, start being treated as state actors. No longer have politicians deciding how to regulate them. It's going to be the First Amendment. They're going to be subject to the same constraints as the government. Terrible idea. Why? Right now, platforms try and, and prohibit at least some content that we put that people in my field called awful but lawful. Not obscene pornography, terrorist pro uh, propaganda that falls short of the Brandenburg standard, lots of hate speech, on and on and on. There's a whole bunch of kind of things that people say, lies that people say that are fully protected by the First Amendment under black letter law but that Facebook doesn't want on its platform, thank goodness. And that most of the mainstream platforms don't want. Why do they not want them? Because Mark Zuckerberg's a great guy? No, because he has a profit point. And he knows that that content is gonna drive away users and more importantly for him, advertisers. If we sub subjected him to the state action doctrine, he loses the power to do that. And I think that's a bad result. I think that's socially a bad result. I think there can be platforms, as Twitter was in its youth before it developed a serious ISIS problem, where they choose not to moderate. Sure. That's, that's, I believe in competition with platforms. But I think trying to say that the First Amendment applies to platforms is a terrible thing. Academic freedom. I think there is scope under current law to extend some academic freedom rights, higher education, students and faculty, and probably overly focused on faculty because, you know, me, my wife, um, but students do. But it's going to be limited because that no one thinks that a faculty member has unlimited free speech rights. Because if I'm assigned the job of teaching administrative law, and I decide, eh, I want to teach free speech law instead, and that's all I talk about all semester. They can and should fire me, and I work for a state school because I'm not doing my job. If I write a paper, but not one paper, because I have tenure, but if I write a series of papers that completely fail to meet professional standards of you know, care and diligence, that's a problem. They absolutely can deny me a promotion. And that's all legitimate, but notice that's that's a pretty big intrusion on what I can say, my free speech rights. With maybe it is true that within those bounds, higher education students and professors maybe have some First Amendment rights to express unpopular views. Though it really becomes hard when the issues become curriculum, such as whether what you can teach in the classroom, because obviously universities have some right to control. K through 12, I think it's a non-starter. I think that the idea that the states control the curriculum in K through 12 is so ingrained into our system. There's no way that this Supreme Court would, and I think probably should, though this is where I'm uncertain, interfere on First Amendment grounds. So what do we do? Well, as I said, this is where I say math. Um, I do think we should be actively encouraging platform competition as much as possible. We should never have let Facebook buy Instagram. And if possible, we should make them spit it off. There's no reason why Mark Zuckerberg needs to control both of those platforms. And he does. There's more than 50% of the voting shares in the parent corporation. Um, I think generally, concentrated ownership of these platforms is not ideal. I'm thinking of you, Elon Musk. Um, I think that publicly traded corporations, honestly, I trust more than egotistical tech, tech billionaires. Um, and this is strange, right? It's not like, I mean, I, you probably guessed I come from the political left. It's not like I was raised to believe in corporations, but I kind of do more than egoists or government. Um, so that's something we could, I think, do. <laughs> Private universities, I think pressure is certainly important that they actually stick to their commitments to academic freedom. Regulation worries me for all the same reasons that regulation always worries me. And we're seeing, so the Florida example suggests that I'm right to be worried. Public universities, like you and my institution. I don't know. Here, we come into what Robert Post talks about this problem 
of different spheres, where in some ways public universities sit in the public debate sphere. This is where public debate happens in many ways, and it needs to, and openness to viewpoints, openness to dialogue is important. But actually, the main job of public universities is to educate. And when you're educating, not all ideas are equal. Some exams get A's and some exams get C's. Is that based on the content of what was written? Yeah. What are you going to do, right? Problem is in the educational sphere and to some extent in the research sphere because of professional norms of sort of competence. Public university is not a free form space. But the moment you, and so there is some regulation is inevitable. And when it's a state university, it's going to be regulation by the state. And I don't see a constitutional principle that says that the Board of Regents has to be completely free of, for whatever the governing body is, the Board of Regents for the University of California has to be free of political influence. It's not. In California, it's a, it's a politically appointed position. And I assume it's true in most states. I don't want to say Florida. Um, and that's inevitable, right? These are public, we're spending public resources. People have a right to oversee that. But then what's the solution? I am open to ideas. Um, and I think I will stop there. Any questions? Thank you, Josh. And when we first met, he was young, and I was, you know, not so old. And that was really a really good talk. And a lot there. And I'll have a few comments and then we'll turn it over to yours. Um, so let me just first <clears throat> two parts. First the question is to what extent does the First Amendment still um, protect the centers? And then the what to do question. Um, I don't know that it's uh, there is a argument that the First Amendment is still active in protecting. Uh, religious conservative um, uh, centers from such things as in the master bakery case, you know, making uh, cake, uh, protecting these centers from the extension of the civil rights laws to cover gay and uh, trans, uh, uh, protect gay and trans people, and uh, because they uh, end with, you know, pronouns that they don't want to. Um, use the a, a person's preferred pronouns, but you have coming up in the court now uh, cases having to do with um, uh, the, the 303 creative case in which uh, the court heard an argument in which um, a, a, a website or any website did, uh, did not uh, want to make uh, uh, for same sex uh, you um, a, a website for a same-sex wedding and in, in, in the masterpiece making things which making so there is that thought that I think it's hard those cases are hard but but that, that in terms of um protecting the set and uh the um so-called cancel culture um on campus now the first amendment would not under current doctrine uh, would be irrelevant to private speech but Public schools it certainly wouldn't be, and but then you get into Robert Post's problem. Um, it's not the, 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 the universities are not uh, uh, um, high park, and there may be limits, but it, but but there may be uh, uh, transgressions, and there are the centers there who I think um, uh, are uh, being uh, unconstitutionally suppressed. I, the the the. Um, I'll get your reaction to that. With, with, with respect uh, to the um, um, uh, the public accommodation cases and um, uh, uh, religious liberties versus um, gay uh, and trans protection, uh, that I'm not sure that that's suppression of the sense of, um, of certainly um, mem many members of the conservative community. Community think it is, and then uh, so I'll get your comment on that, and then I'll say a word or two about what to 
to do. Uh, I agree with you wholeheartedly that you do not want to just expand the uh, or diminish the state to alter the state action uh, uh, doctrine so that uh, a private censorship on um, social media is uh, 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 subject to certain languages. It's a horrible idea. I agree with you with that. But um, maybe we could go back to some earlier jurisprudence where private shopping centers are uh, uh, controlled by the First Amendment, um, uh, where, um, and you know what I just, um, uh, and that, um, uh, uh, that actually, I'd ask you to consider about um, more generally what uh, goes on in Europe with the Euro European uh, uh, Court of uh, Human Rights uh, with the, what's called the horizontal effect, which they uh, expand the protection of constitutional norms uh, to um, uh, to private actors, maybe in the work private workplace, maybe make the private workplace more like the public workplace, as you rightly point out, about a whole lot of protection in the government workplace. Anyhow, with those comments, I'll let you um, answer those, and then I'll take questions for you. So very briefly, um, on the, the religious conservatives thing, yes, you're right, that is absolutely an area where the court has been active. I think given the lack of activists about all other dissenters, I think it's very problematic when the judiciary picks their favorite dissenters and says, you get protections, but nobody else, and that's what's going on here, I mean, honestly, pretty clearly. Um, whether how much protection should be available, that's hard. Um, it's, I mean, I, I personally think that when if you're running a business, you don't have a right to discriminate in choosing your clients. And I don't care if you're selling photography or lamps. Um, but beyond that, there are hard First Amendment questions. On public universities and misgendering, it's so illustrative. So there's a case currently bubbling in the courts in which a professor at a state school, the small state school, I don't remember which one, was intentionally misgendering a student who was trans, a trans student, based on his religious beliefs. He was disciplined and he won on First Amendment grounds. I, that's a really hard one. I actually think that case is wrong. Yeah, I because I think that when you're in your capacity as a teacher, you actually got to adjust your students' needs and themselves, right? I mean, it's not like you could use some sort of racial effort in class and it would be okay. Um, but it illustrates what I am very slowly to um, stop. It doesn't, it illustrates the really hard thing, which is, is that outside of the university classroom setting, yeah, I don't like this gender, but I can see it. You couldn't punish it under the First Amendment. There's no way. Um, so it, it actually illustrates where these things really become hard. What about the more general? I agree with you on this, Ms. Chittering, but what about the more general sort of so called cancel culture? On campus, where professors are being uh, um, punished, long investigations for um, 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 intemperate uh, tweet. Uh, tweet. Oh, well, that, that's handling, right? That's I mean, yeah, that's a, that's. A, but that's, that's a, a private school, school. right? But public schools, yeah. I actually think that, that, that of course, there's a person. Okay. Um, absolutely, as long as it helps. Except for Garcetti, I don't know. I don't know what First Amendment rights I have. Supreme Court has been no, but no. What, what do you think? Do you think that there really is dissenters being suppressed by by state institutions in in uh, uh, college campuses? Yes, uh, I think the extent of it has been overstated a little bit, but I think it's that it happens. Okay, I'm going to stop there and actually open up to questions. Yes. Thought experiment. If uh, all the educational institutions were private, would this problem be lessened? It would be different, um, but I don't think it would be lessened. Because, but I guess it's a question: Is this right? There's two visions of what kind of university ecosphere you want. One is you want most universities to be open to all perspectives, because we think it's important for students to have be exposed to all perspectives. And that should be true of private public. In that world, I think private universities, I don't think that solves the problem because I think a lot of private universities would double down on sort of ideological commitments. And I think public universities at least are facing a First Amendment overhang. Um, at a minimum, with respect to say, 
invited speakers, they can't engage in viewpoint discrimination. And everyone agrees with that. That would not be true of the Harvard um, And the other option is you want siloed universities. You want universities that cater to particular perspectives. And we have a little bit of that, right? We have some cons avowedly conservative universities, some avowedly left-wing universities. I don't like that. I don't, I think we have enough siloing online. I would hate to have 18 to 22 year old students start their lives completely siloed. But I think that's the, where um, pressure would lead in all private university systems. Uh, yes, you know, you, uh, yeah. hi, thank you for coming and speaking. Uh, I, I wanted to ask, um, there's a lot of viral content going around of senators asking appointed members uh, during the nomination process about their private actions as citizens, like, did you or did you not tweet this controversial statement? Would that qualify as like some sort of First Amendment uh, infraction by the government trying to punish you for your private speech or no? It's an appointment to just like, for instance, there was an appointment, I think it was Josh Hawley who was questioning someone about their appointment mm -hmm. to the National Archive. Uh, yeah. So my answer to this is, does it raise First Amendment issues? Yeah. Is it litigable? Absolutely not. That's got to be a political question. It cannot be that we we have a, the courts have a right to reconsider what basis senators have for voting for it. Yeah. You were speaking earlier about uh, social media and the absence of state action. Um, we obviously do have, you know, elected officials do have their own official accounts, and I, I you know, I'm aware of some lawsuits that were filed, uh, uh, you know, challenging, right? Whenever they, they don't like to comment, it's critical of them, believe, 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 right? Um, I don't know exactly why I didn't follow them all the way through, and I just kind of what the current state of law is in that, in that area. Whether or not that's kind of almost a limited public forum. So, I, full disclosure, I participated in that litigation by Amicus Briefs. Um, and the state of the law is courts that have considered the issue of consistently held that if an account is treated as a public account, if you say that it's part of your job, in particular, this is Donald Trump's Twitter account when he was president. Um, he said, and the White House announced that this is an official account because he was firing people via his personal Twitter, right? Which, <laughs> including the Secretary of State, I think. And so um, courts have consistently held that that's a forum of some sort, and you cannot engage in viewpoint discrimination. And that strikes me, that has to be. It's got, I mean, you, you can impose reasonable rules of the road. I suspect that banning like curse words would be okay, because I think some content discrimination, it's a limited, not like, deep into the black letter. Yeah. But, um, but the courts have been pretty consistent with the public forum. I, I'll be honest with you, I think if Trump had done what made sense, which is to fire people right out of via the White House Twitter, they do have one, and express his views via his personal Twitter, different case. And that's right. And that's not a public forum. And that is what I would think elected officials should do is some separation between their official acts and their personal acts. Yes. So relating to the social media platforms and their incentives to moderate content, would uh, like either truncating or repealing something like Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act, um, I guess, force them to internalize that, or do you think it would pose more risk of burning the core of the people? Yeah, uh, this is something I've been thinking about a lot because of the Gonzalez case. Um, plus, you know, the one thing that Joe Biden and Donald Trump agreed upon in the 220 elect 2020 election, they both publicly called for repealing Section 230. Hmm. Well, yes. <laughs> Here's why repealing it is a terrible idea. <laughs> so Facebook has 2 billion monthly unique users. Despite all of its content moderation system, and it spends huge amounts of money on it. And you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a believer in St. Zuckerberg or anything, but they do have a system in place. They make mistakes all the time. And part of the problem is they operate in literally dozens of languages. And they make many more mistakes in smaller languages because it's harder to find people who know those languages. The Myanmar problem was a big problem. Sri Lanka was a big problem. Um, it's one thing in English and you know in Spanish and in German, where there's a ton of people you can easily hire. Um, mistakes are going to happen. If they're liable for those mistakes, they're liable. Their incentive is going to be to over moderate like crazy. 
but just go crazy. And, and, because, and that's in fact, there's some evidence that in Europe that's starting to happen. Um, Germany have adopted a very strict law against hate speech online. And it's clear what's happening is the platforms are just pulling down stuff willy nilly because they don't want to face massive fines, including clearly protected political content. I think that's a bad lesson. So I think some immunity actually has to be there. The idea that if you impose liability on them, hey, they're just going to perfectly manage things, they're just not trying hard enough, that's an illusion. Um, the other thing is, or they might, the other than over-regulating, the other possible strategy is to say, eh, we want to be common carriers now. We don't want to, we're just, we're like the phone company. This is what the, the basis of the Florida and Texas legislation was now you're common carriers. Well, great. ISIS, welcome, right? I mean, that's ISIS propaganda is protected if it originates within the United States, short of Brandenburg. Hate speech, let's go for it. Not obscene pornography, let's go for it. I would stop using social media in that world. Um, and I suspect most of us would. And there are some people who say, oh, well, that's fine. I'm like, no, killing new technologies. First of all, killing new technologies is just not, doesn't happen. But when in a second, the platforms would probably migrate overseas, honestly, where they, they couldn't be held liable. And that's as someone who lives in the Bay Area, that's not so great. Um, so I don't tweaks, maybe, maybe there's some like the FOSTA legislation that did limit to 30 liability for sex trafficking. I could maybe support tweaks like that, but that's kind of it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Um, um, <clears throat> so actually, I think a lot of us, folks in the lobby right now, have a first amendment influence speech, uh, Garcetti, Pickering on college. Um, but I was interested in the, you mentioned the, the trans pronoun case we talked about, right? The what? The, the case with the professor yeah. who using law firms. I mean, think that that would cause actual disruption, right? That's the argument on the other side. Yes. yes. But and yet the professor won the case. Yes. In that case. Yes. Can you talk about conflicts between actual disruption standards or like the I the court basically well they he did it was remanded. There was summary judgment on, on behalf of the school at the district court level. Sixth circuit, I want to say it's the sixth circuit, remanded. Um, it was one of the even circuits, and I think it's six thirty. Um, and it, it they remanded to, to litigate the actual disruption. Think of what actual disruption is. Is it disruption to make a student incredibly uncomfortable, but the student doesn't say anything in class? I think it is. I think it interferes with the person's ability to actually gain an education. But these are areas, especially at the university, right? Where students are presumptively adults, where it's it's a it's completely open. No one has resolved these issues. I don't remember for sure, but I thought that there was some kind of compromise worked out where uh, he wouldn't, the, a professor wouldn't call the uh, person by his dead pronoun. You know, yeah, but he would say uh, just uh, that student or by the last name or something. Right? Yeah, in these cases we get. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it got in the word, but it got seriously, yeah, it, 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 the details I just want. Yeah, me neither. That's all I was um, Yes. So what issues do you see upcoming regarding content that is either produced or curated autonomously, you either, you know, by algorithms generally or by machine learning, AI, hmm. if you will? What is the, what is who do? Uh, so you, what issues do you see upcoming oh. with content that is... I hate to use the word AI. Yeah. No, 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 chat, GBT, whatever. Um, so in addition to being a law professor, I'm an executive editor for a journal called Journal Free Speech Law. Um, and we're doing a symposium on this very topic. So, and it's, everything's free online. So just Google it in a few months. Um, but I'm not participating because I don't know what the answer is. Um, how, starting off with basics, does speech generated by AI receive First Amendment protection? Absolutely, in my view. But that's because it's reflected in my first, the myth of rights. I don't think the First Amendment is a rights-generating provision, primarily. 
the free exercise clause of the First Amendment, maybe. There are historical reasons we could talk about. But I think the free speech, press assembly clauses, there are limits on governmental power. They're not rights generated. And it doesn't matter if there's no author for the content that the AI generates. It's still communicative content, which the government cannot suppress. Um, I mean, if you want to find an author, I guess you go to the programmers and the corporation and say, you're the authors. But I don't care. Everyone else cares who has the free speech right. I'm like, you're missing. That's a standing issue. But the question of what the First Amendment permits is basically it limits governmental speech to power to speech. To what extent can the government regulate AI algorithms? For example, we know that AI algorithms tend to, because our society is incredibly discriminatory and bigoted, AI tends to pick up the bigotry. My friend, Nana Pumfender, has written a lot about this. Can you regulate that? Ask me in five years. I have no idea. That's the hard question for me. 